What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Brandon's Face, the podcast about a playlist. My name is Jonathan Beardsley, and as always, I'm joined by the titular face of the podcast, Brandon May. Brandon, how you doing tonight? I am slightly confused. Uh, about after, what? Dr- about after Drake and Kanye got back together, you know? Oh, yes. We will be talking about all of that <laughs> shortly, my friend. Um Please like, follow, and subscribe. You can find us on all major podcasting platforms. You can find us on YouTube, Instagram, our own website, brandonsface.com. Am I missing anything? Uh, Reddit. And Reddit. So be sure to say hi if you see us online. With that out of the way, let's get into this, man. First up, we have a new one from Drugs, Outcast vs. Everyone, featuring Brennan Savage. How are you feeling about this one? Uh, this album is shaping up to be very good. I don't know who Brennan Savage is, but he adds an interesting layer to this track. I do not know who he is either. I liked this song, but it's probably my least favorite of the singles we've heard so far. I agree Same. that the album is shaping up, though, to be pretty sick. Yeah, man. Okay, and let's talk about this one you threw on here from Viagra Boys, Troglodyte. Bizarre does not begin to describe yeah. it, man. <laughs> Are, so they're they're what two songs into this rollout are you are you fucking with this a- abs- absolutely man they've got such a weird energy to them and it's weird in like the best way i still don't know if i love it or hate it um <laughs> it's it's bizarre it's really cool at times like what they're doing musically is very interesting and keeps me listening Again, still have no fucking idea if they like it, but their new album, Cave World, comes out July 8th, so we'll definitely be reviewing that. Nice. Okay, next up we got Death Cab for Cutie's new one, Roman Candles. Are you a big Death Cab for Cutie fan? Define big? I mean, Translaticism is a seminal album, in my opinion. It's it's really a beautiful piece of art. Um there's uh, a lot of their music that I really enjoy, and there's some that I really don't. Where did this fall on that spectrum? Kind of right in the middle, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, 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 I don't like it, and I don't dislike it. I think it's, um, it's got a weird energy to it. Not like with Viagra Boys, where their weird energy is like, all right, let's party. This Very is a weird energy where it's yeah. weird. I, I do agree. I was surprised at how much I liked this, though. Um, I've never considered myself a fan of Death Cab for Cutie, which is why I've asked. And I absolutely hated that last cover they did that you added. <laughs> but I thought this was good. The guitar getting progressively more distorted was pretty cool. You are not a big fan of covers as is. No. It just always reminds me of the family guy. I love this song, especially when amateurs sing the lyrics. (laughs) (laughs) And it just like (laughs) every time that's where my head goes. But I do appreciate some. We've had a few break through my my exterior. You know, uh, I just recently found out about a band who did a cover. Um, uh, The original song was by the Dead Kennedys. Song is called Nazi Punks Fuck Off. Great Mm -hmm. song. Uh, Napalm Death does a cover of that song. Interesting. Which okay. is interesting to say the least. I will have to check that cover out. That song plays a role in the movie Green Room. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You're not a big horror guy. I, I want to say I have seen Green Room, but it's... Um, one it's of the last movie. Anton Yelkin movies before he passed away. It's got the dude that was uh, on Star Trek on it. Um yeah, Captain Picard. Okay, it's it's good. We'll talk about that some other time, though. Okay. Okay, let's talk about this new My Chemical Romance song, The Foundations of Decay. <laughs> is, you want to go first? You want me to go song? first? <laughs> I want to just talk about it. Is it a bad song or is it a bad mix? Or is it both? It, it's it's a bad mix, bro. My I, I, I really like the music and the breakdown is really cool, man. Like, the breakdown is really cool and... I think the instrumentation, the way they play their music, the way they play their instruments is really neat. Um, The style in which this song um, is structured is very similar to Bullets. Um, You Brought Me Your Bullets uh, and I'll Bring You My Love, I think is the album title. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, this song got a lot of comparisons online to 
a lot of people were saying, it sounds just like Bullets. I'm so excited. And I went back and listened to Bullets all the way through. And this song has a much worse mix than that entire album does. That album is mixed very, very well. Um, uh, it's obviously intentional on this one. Either they released an unfinished track or they specifically mixed it like this. So I, I actually left really confused here. Um, I just think it's weird. Sounds like he's singing into a tin can. Yeah, it's that seems to be most people's takeaway. I agree. The breakdown is really, really sick, and I wasn't really expecting it, but I think people should acknowledge that there are cool parts of this song. It's kind of hard to like gauge my disappointment level in it because I didn't like their last record much, so I didn't have any expectations for this. But... I think like obviously being a nostalgic person and specifically for this era of music, I was so happy to see them back that like, I don't really care that the song isn't great. I'd rather have them releasing music than not, but I will admit bullets is my least favorite of their big three albums. And I don't like this as much as I like anything on bullets. So if Bullets fans are digging this, then good for them. But I don't know, man. I'll I'll definitely check out more music from them and be happy to see it. But this one was not a home run, unfortunately. My wife is on record saying that we did not deserve three cheers because of how good it is. Yeah, you and I have been talking about doing like a top 10 scene albums of all time, which will be a lot of fun. And I'm excited to do that with you. And I think when you get into like the big heavy hitters, the Fallout Boys, the My Chemical Romances, the Taking Back Sundays, the Use, whosever discography you're visiting at the time seems like the best. But whenever you get to three cheers, you're like, this might be the best album that any of them ever released. Like, <laughs> there's not a miss on it. It's crazy. No. It, it comes down to whether it's the most personal for you. And I guess we'll find out if it is for you and I whenever we get to that pod. But this didn't quite live up to the glory days, but dude, it it's not ever going to. Like they're at that stage. This isn't Chinese democracy. <laughs> like it's not <laughs> that bad. <laughs> no, I, I it's again, the song itself, good song. The mix is just awful, man. I I I really wanted to like it. Everybody was hyping it up. Every people were texting me, bro, like fucking new my cam. And I'm like, okay, l- l- let me go look at it. And it was just, you know, you know, that guy who reviews fast food, um, yeah. on the internet, he goes, well, mm-hmm. what is it? My day is ruined. My disappointment is immeasurable. <laughs> that it's was kinda, you. Kind of how I felt, man. <laughs> like, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair takeaway, but hopefully this isn't the last new song of theirs we get this year. I'd be very surprised if this wasn't at least the start of something. I mean, they're on tour. I think they were really gearing up to start an album rollout pre-COVID when they first announced Mm -hmm. those shows. And then, you know. Yeah, I was going to ask you how long you think they've been sitting on this. I think they've been said that, which is why I think it's intentional. I, I, at this point for them to release some sort of unfinished song would make zero sense. So the mix is intentional and I really hope we don't get an album with this and with like this mix on it. So, yeah, I went back and, uh, I was driving the other day after listening to the song and I put on, this is how I disappear. And I was like, yeah, there's a, there's a big difference here <laughs> and uh, it's very obvious, but again. I'm telling you, man, everybody was comparing it to bullets. And I, I went back and listened to the entire album just to like verify that I wasn't absolutely fucking insane that like, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like that. Um, good news for everybody. I'm not insane. Well, at least in this aspect. So, where does Bullets rank for you in their discography? Number two, above above Black Cheers. Parade. Okay, okay, above Black Parade. Okay, wow, hot take. I I I, I like the Black Parade. Teenagers is a great song. Um, the Black Parade is a really great sing along. But we'll get into we'll get into this more. We'll talk later. about that some other time. All right, let's talk about this new Elohim remix of Spider by Said the Sky and Boy in Space. I'm not familiar with either of these artists. I'm familiar with Elohim, obviously, because of you. 
How you liking this one? I like this. Um, Set the Sky has shown up on a couple of festival lineups um, or may have even been like a supporting act with somebody that I, I wanted to go see or something. And so I recognize Set the Sky, but Elohim is always going to get my love. So I like this. It wasn't anything revolutionary, but it was good. Yeah. I didn't really have any other notes other than I liked it, but great. I do liked it too. Yeah. All right, man. Let's talk about this new Mark Ronson track featuring Lucky Day called Too Much. I am both impressed and not surprised at how well Lucky Day can pull off this style of 80s pop. This has just been a huge fucking year for him. Um, <laughs> are you liking this this song at all? I know this it's song got me fucking moving, man. This is funky as hell. Great bass line, great groove. I was moving around. I was dancing. In my chair. Yeah, this is this is much more pop than he usually does. Obviously, it being a Mark Ronson instrumental, I think Mark Ronson was definitely in his Quincy Jones bag on this beat. It's really, really good. It's very really good. 80s. Very, very well done. I, I liked it. Okay, man, let's talk about this new one from Aaron Ray Gold. This one, I think his vocals are just immaculate and i was super underwhelmed with his last single with d smoke but this one is much more my speed and like i said his voice the melodies it's it's all just working for me on this track did you like it yeah i did like it i've never heard of aaron ray so i don't know if i should have have we have we reviewed him yeah we did a song he did with d smoke a couple weeks uh, ago which i'm pretty sure you there said it is fine. Yep. it's I, not a yeah it wasn't I, a big one i think his voice is great it's just nothing special for me on, the, on this track, at least. Yeah. I, I mean, I think his voice is really good on this one. Better than the last one. But still no album announcement. We'll see if we get a full project from him soon. We'll see. Okay, man. I'm fucking excited about this one. We got a new one from Mika. Yo-Yo. The same night Kendrick Lamar dropped. Because Mika <laughs> gives zero fucks. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I... I've never heard Mika do something this heavy in terms of like a club banger, but I really like it. And I hope his next album is much more of this style. How are you yeah, feeling? Yeah, man. He's got that. He's got this kind of dark dance floor house vibe. I just, I love this vibe. Um, I'm really digging this one. The vocals that don't have that kind of dark dance floor drive kind of like help it have this almost like polarizing feel, which is, Something that I uh, really enjoyed. I really liked this one. I did as well. And I know it doesn't make any sense, but now that Mika is potentially going in more of a dance direction, I want a Mika Craig David collab. <laughs> yeah, you do. People. Yeah, you I do. I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of collabs, we got a new one from Kali Uchis and Softest Hard called La Luz. Have you ever heard of the Softest Hard person before? I have not, but I do know that this is a fucking banger. I mean, yes, it is a certified banger. This is my first time hearing soft as hard as soft as hard as well. From what I can gather, she's a producer and DJ signed to hard records. I didn't even know hard had a record label. That's weird Um, because didn't Insomniac buy hard? I did they? I think so. Interesting. Oh, I'll have to look into that. Um, but she's on the hard summer lineup, so it's not really a surprise that she's on hard records if they do have a label. She's got a super bass heavy style. It works though. This is a good song. Nothing we haven't heard before though. Callie's incredible on this because she's incredible on everything. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Do you have any extra notes on this one? No, my notes literally say this is a fucking banger. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Agreed, man. Agreed. <laughs> All right, let's get into a slew of EDM that you threw on here. First up, we got Armin Van Buren, Avira, and Chicane Offshore. Talk to me about this one. Uh, Trance. I I honestly thought that we were going to get like a vocal Armin Van Buren with all of the collaborators here, but I guess they're all producers. I didn't hear any vocals on this. I listened to it a few times. Um, I'm cool without them, but I was just a little confused. It's a good Trance song. It's Armin Van Buren. I thought it was a little generic. It's it, I, I didn't say it was great. I said it was good. No, you're, I'm going to judge your entire taste based on you saying you like this song. <laughs> um, Armin was the first DJ I ever saw live. And 
that'll have a special place in my heart because of that night and that time in my life. But in terms of his music, I really only like like three Armin albums and his live mixes. His his more recent stuff doesn't really do it for me. That's fair. Um, I still have yet to see Armin Van Buren live, and I feel like I missed the boat. Yeah, I think for in Southern California, it's going to be difficult because everything he does there is so festival based now. But that that together is one show looking back is so weird that dead mouse was playing on like an outdoor stage in front of i don't know like a maybe a thousand people while armin was inside doing eight hours 12 hours whatever the fuck it was and i was armin just only walking around very minimally aware of who these people were at the time it was a lot of fun man and armin live is just an incredible experience the armin only shows especially because he has all the vocalists there and seeing him like do going wrong live with like the acoustic guitar and everything was really really cool man so really good show yeah Yeah, that was awesome honestly that was the show to see him at um and i think i i'm pretty sure one of my other friends um was at that was at that show uh actually doing press that's incredible man that yeah that was awesome. That that area of LA at night is very surreal <laughs> when you're out there at like 4 a.m. getting out of something like that. <laughs> it's it's a bizarre place to kind of wake up to, I guess. <laughs> All right, man. Let's talk about this new one from Benny Benassi and Annabelle England called Light Waves. I feel like I've seen her name before, but I can't place it. Um, do you know her? Off yes. The top of your head? Where do we know her from? She's she has the uh she she does she does a lot of vocals on a lot of house music um so you've definitely seen her name a number of times um oh she was on that vintage culture song last year that i really liked that's it i think she just has uh kind of like almost the perfect voice for house music it's it just kind of works really well this is the first time I've heard Noop Benassi since, like, the Electro Man album, I think. Yep. It's been a while. A uh, l- little heavier than I was expecting, but I think it's good. And I agree with you 100%. Her voice is perfect for this. This is a fucking banger, bro. Welcome back, Benny Benassi. Welcome back, man. Do you remember back when you would be in line to get into, like, a rave and in the line they would be playing satisfaction and everyone would go fucking crazy yep sure do it's the ultimate song man it's impossible to not have a good time in public when that's playing (laughs) it's it's honestly it's iconic man and uh it it, it, i mean anybody drops that at a festival during like a festival set you'll get the entire crowd going i don't care how boring the person is that's in the crowd they're gonna get going in terms of being iconic, that's got to be a top 10 song in the genre all time. For sure. Okay, man. Let's talk about this new one from Drum Complex, Way Too. Have we reviewed Drum Complex before? A number of times, yes. Okay. I have a bad memory, apparently. Did you like this? Me too. Yeah, I actually really liked this, John. Um, I. Uh, it, it's It's techno obviously um the drum breaks i think are really cool the creeping bass line i fucking love this one this is actually one of my favorite drum complex tracks in a while what about you did you like this i did i thought it was a certified warehouse banger i can see boys noise playing this live which is kind of my barometer for a good song <laughs> so if i can close my eyes and picture it then it's good i I can only imagine what dark corner of the web you find this shit in, though, man. <laughs> uh, I've been following Drum Complex for a couple of years back when um, I really got into techno. And um, I was uh, just doing a lot of listening to only techno for like shit, like six months, man. And um, this like the he his his name came up, I think, I on like a dub fire rabbit hole I, I, I jumped in on and. Um, I think he's finally starting to come to uh, to a little bit more of the mainstream. Uh, I guess not. He only has thirty thousand monthly listeners, but this shit this shit goes hard, bro. It does. It does. And even though I don't remember reviewing his stuff before, I really really liked this. So thanks for throwing it on. No problem. Okay, man. We got a, another new one from Jay Wara. We reviewed one last month from 
little boots or last week what is time who knows thursday <laughs> what a concept time doesn't uh, exist bro <laughs> this is the lpgob remix of their song check out I thought this was going to be a straightforward house track, but when the beat dropped, I was floored by how funky this shit got, man. Yep. LP Giobi, don't know who he is, but he killed this. So we actually, I threw this on because I clicked follow on Jay Wara after we reviewed that uh, that little boot song and then this track came out. We have actually reviewed an, another uh, an LP Giobi remix before. I feel like we have. What was it? It was the Portugal the Man What Me Worry remix. That's that right. Yep. And uh, so I saw this on there and I was like, this is the second Jay Wara song and the second LP Kiobi mix that I've heard. I need to hear this. And I and I was like, oh, okay. So it turns out I like both of these artists. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's a sick song, man. I really liked this remix. It was great. I really like this one, too. I'm glad you liked it. All right, man, let's talk about this new one from Elenium featuring Spirit Box. So if you did not show me Spirit Box a few months ago, this track would have probably confused me a little bit. <laughs> but thanks to you, I was ready for it. Did you like this one? All right. So we've got two worlds colliding. Um yeah, I, I texted you like months ago about Spirit Box when I went on kind of a deep metal core dive. And yeah, here we are, man. Um I, I have one question for you. I did enjoy this song, and I like it, and I think it was mainly geared towards people like me. But do you think that hardcore Elenium fans are now listening to a bunch of metalcore? Or do you think a bunch of Spirit Box fans are now listening to a bunch of Elenium? I, 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 really want, I really want your take on this. Does this do anything for either artist here, or is it really just a fun collaboration? I had the same exact train of thought you did, Brandon. No, you didn't. So I dug a little bit into it. And I think the Elenium tracks that do super big numbers are very poppy. But this isn't as big of a change from like his track with I Prevail or even like the trippy red one. They're both very like gritty in the sound, not quite like this or like this one is very tailored to what Spirit Box does. But Elenium has a more diverse discography than I kind of remembered. Like, like I said, the guy's got fucking songs with John Bellion and I Prevail and Trippy Red, and none of it sounds weird. Like, he has a really wide-ranging sound. So I think, I don't know if he gains much from this, but I, I don't think he loses anything. And yeah, I think Spirit Box gains a lot because he is currently... Not ranked in the world, but has multiple songs at like a quarter to a half billion plays. So she's doing okay. Uh, for what it's worth, I saw I Prevail in 2019 and uh, they fucking rock, bro. Yeah, I don't, I don't I love know. I, I, prevail. I, I, I don't really seek out their music a whole lot. Um, but man, that show was really cool, man. They know how to take over a stage. They do, man. I Prevail is awesome. I, I saw uh, Bring Me the Horizon on the same stage at the same festival, and uh, I really liked I Prevail a lot more. Was it daytime when you saw Bring Me the Horizon? Uh, yeah, it was like at sunset-ish. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, I don't know, man. I don't know about any modern Bring Me the Horizon live, but like the last time I saw them on the Sandpit Turtle Tour... <laughs> they, when they op- that's the name of the album now it's not Sim Paternal it's is Sim it not? Paternal is it not <laughs> uh, um, is this not rap music <laughs> it's uh, when they opened with can you feel my heart like oh, man. them at that time at their peak opening with what I think is maybe their best song like they used to have it live man but I saw them before that and they were fucking terrible <laughs> so <laughs> I think it could go either way, but I I would not, I would go in with my expectations very moderate if I were going to see them again. Well, I'm really glad you liked this track. Um, I I like both of these artists and I saw that this collab happened and I was like, this is, this is weird. I'm into it. So I fucking love it. Yeah. Bizarre. All right. Let's move on, man to a new one from Sid and West End. Let me take you. 
I thought this was a good track, but it feels like a radio mix to me. And as you've said, we are not children. Give me an extended mix, please and thank you. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, with, with that being said, though, this track has been stuck in my head all week. Oh, it's catchy. It, I wonder if it's because of the length that, that it gets stuck in your head. It could be, but um, I will say one of the... Uh, it reminded me, as far as catchiness goes, uh, white noise from Disclosure. It reminded me of that kind of, yeah, that kind of vibe, yeah. you know. Uh, do 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 You know. Yeah, that like shuffly house, right? For sure, for sure. I picked that up. Sid's a really good producer. I like his stuff usually. Yeah, me too. Did you add this or did I? You added this. Oh, okay. All right, man. Let's move on to this new one from rain city drive waiting on you i was surprised you threw this on but very happy you did <laughs> you turned me on to them man it's like poppy post hardcore i don't know it's really interesting i dig it yeah i i really like both songs we've heard from them so far uh anthony and eric the producer he works with did not work on this specific track but i think they might have done more with them that haven't been released yet oh cool all right, man. Let's move on to Adam Bayer, DJ Rush, the Restore My Soul. I think this is the Hilo remix. I'm not sure. I think so. It just says remix on it. So, fuck yeah, if I, I think. Know. Okay. Yeah, just remix. We'll go with that. It's techno. I'm going to review this track with a lyric from it. This music is powerful. It restores my soul. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said, man. Great. You're a great track. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, very fucking heavy. Very good. I love it. Okay, man. Let's move on to this DJ. How do you pronounce it? I've never known. I think Coves. Coves? That sounds right. Okay, DJ Coves remix of Ocean uh, featuring Jamie Foxx by Solomon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go first because we've never talked about Coves, and I just I don't get it. I've never understood DJ Coves. He gets a lot of critical acclaim. But I find his style more interesting than fun to listen to. And I feel that way with this remix as well. Like, it's not bad, but I still prefer the original over this version. I, di I just don't really like how he treated the vocals on this one. But how do you feel about the song and how do you feel about DJ Coe's as a whole? So I liked this song better than the original. I don't know why I couldn't pin the tail on that donkey. But um, so I, I did I did enjoy it. But okay. I will agree with you that I don't I don't get the hype around DJ Coe's. There's a yeah. lot of hype around him. Like there, there, there's a lot of hype. And mm -hmm. I I for the life of me, I can't really figure out what's so enticing or enamoring with Is it like Aphex twin adjacent? Is that like a thing? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think, know. Is anybody really Aphex twin adjacent? Um Yeah, I I, maybe I haven't dived into his discography enough, and if anybody's listening and is a fan of DJ Coe's, let us know what we should be listening to to understand the hype, because I just don't get it. Yeah, I remember listening to his 2018 album, Knock Knock, and that one just, I just didn't get it, but... I don't know. Maybe maybe I need to revisit it. Maybe, like you said, somebody who's a fan of his can point out what we're missing. Right. Okay, man, let's move on to a new one from Neo called Don't Love Me. So I'm going to say it before you do. The only thing I do not like about this song is the stupid dashboard confessional hat he's wearing <laughs> in the cover art for it. Brandon. You did beat me to it, sir. Is that in your notes? Definitely. <laughs> yeah i love this shit i'm impressed that he's still so top tier at this stage how did you feel i i liked it as well um it's a neo track it's great yes his, his voice is great it's it's quintessential neo yes you can tell in the way that it is correct that's it that's it <laughs> okay man yeah i don't think there's more to say there if he releases a new album i will always check it out because he's a legend and has my eternal respect for sure okay let's move on to this new one from danger mouse and black thought called no gold teeth how familiar are you with black thought outside of him being the vocalist of the roots 
I am not familiar with uh, Black Thought at all, and I didn't really even know that he was the vocalist for The Roots. So this ah, is my, okay. I thought it was my first foray into Black Thought, but apparently I was wrong. No, if you've ever heard a Roots song, you've heard Black Thought. If you've ever watched Jimmy Fallon, you've probably heard Black Thought since The Roots is his band and he's always on stage with them. Um, so that means you've never heard his 10 minute Funk Master Flex freestyle. Have not, but I'm okay. definitely interested. Okay, I'll send you that after this, and we'll throw it in the show notes as well. It's widely regarded as the best freestyle of all time. It will leave you floored, and uh, I don't want to say anything more about it than that. However, post Roots, he has started doing a solo career, and he's been releasing these albums called Streams of Thought. I think he's at volume three now. I'm going to throw a volume one on next week's playlist. It's like five songs. Super, really All good. Right. Um, East Coast hip hop. I think you're really going to like it. You know, this this track kind of felt like a freestyle. Um, it just it had that. I, I could I could tell that it, it, it whoever was performing this could do a very good freestyle. Yeah. Yeah. He, he does write and kind of deliver in that very old school way where it seems off the top. Um, this is actually the first single from his upcoming album with Danger Mouse called Cheat Codes. That Fuck yeah. is going to come out August 12th and we'll have features from MF Doom, Rest in Peace, ASAP Rocky, Run the Jewels, Joey Badass, Russ, Raekwon, Conway the Machine, Jesus. and more. Yeah, <laughs> he, he can get whoever he wants, man. He's a fucking legend. Uh, I'm excited for it. Awesome. Well, thank you for showing it to me, and I love this, man. It was, uh, it felt really classic. Yes, fuck yeah, man. I'm glad you liked it. I'm excited to share the freestyle and uh, his first solo EP with you soon. Um, all right, let's move on to the last single we have this week. It's a new one from Danny Lee called Dead to Me. And I'll just go first here since I threw this one on kind of late. I like this song because I like this style of R&B, but there's nothing unique about it. If you told me that this was a Summer Walker song, I would not think twice about it. I mostly added this because it's produced by Dark Child, and he's one of my favorite producers and just one of the best of all time. He's worked on countless hits from the biggest artists of all time, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Beyonce, Brandy, Monica, Jennifer Lopez, Mary J. Blige, on and on and on. And it's really crazy that we just don't hear from him very often and that what he does release kind of goes under the radar. He's worked with this girl, Danny Lee, a few times now, and all the songs are solid, but I wish we'd get, like, one more legendary collab from him, like, have him produce the next Usher album or something, because he clearly still has it. But this is a little understated. What, what were your thoughts on it if you got to listen to it? You already know what my thoughts were. This is not my jam. I did like the yeah. production, though. So, Yeah, I knew it wouldn't be. This song, uh, I'm a fan of hers and his, and I wasn't really a fan of the song. So I knew you were really got it. <laughs> okay, man, you ready to move into the albums? Are you ready to move into the albums, John? I am, buddy, because first up we have Kendrick Lamar, returning with Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. If you don't mind, I'm going to go first here, Brandon. I was I was going to recommend it anyways. And I apologize ahead of time if this is a little wordy, but it's just kind of my thoughts as I was listening to it the first 500 times. <laughs> um, what I love about a new Kendrick release is the unknown. He's one of the only artists that can give me that feeling. And we're going to be reviewing a State Champs album pretty soon that I really enjoyed, but I knew what that album was going to sound like from the second it was announced. Kendrick approaches every project so differently that the speculation of how the new project will sound has become part of the experience. And I think he's the closest thing to monoculture we have in hip hop, honestly. Not everyone's going to like it, but everyone will talk about it. And I think sometimes the best art isn't about unanimous acclaim, it's about sparking conversation. My guess is that he couldn't care less what we think about this album. This is his way of getting five years of time away and lifetime of trauma off of his chest without having to deal with any limitations. And you can tell it took an army of people to create this album. The list of credits for this album is a who's who of writers Massive. and producers. 
I don't think there's less than three writers on any song on here. Uh, there's no shock factor features on here. There is more Kodak Black than I was hoping for, though. <laughs> and for an album talking about the kind of trauma and abuse that this album does, it feels like an oversight to have someone on the album who recently pled guilty to assault and battery of a female high school student years ago. But I guess Kendrick isn't really in the space where he needs to compromise his vision, even if it's messy. And I think sound wise, I was expecting Baby Keem to be on here. And I was expecting some of the songs to skew towards that sound after finding out he had ghost written some of that album. So that didn't really catch me off guard, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't sad we didn't get at least one last TDE feature on the last TDE album of his, because I know they've all shown love online since it dropped, but their absence I think is felt from this. And one last Black Hippie song would have just been incredible, but that's fan servicing. Kendrick does not give a shit about fan service, nor should he, I guess. This is not a perfect album, but I think that's kind of the point of it. It's an album about imperfections and traumas that he's built from. And he's so far past caring about being the greatest rapper alive or being a savior anymore, something he literally says on this album. This isn't an album even trying to make a commercial impact, even though it will definitely be one of the top selling albums of the year and probably the, the decade. Like there's some jams on here, but there's no obvious radio hits. It's way too early to say where this will rank in Kendrick's discography. I don't think it's possible for any album to ever top Good Kid Mad City to me. This album is challenging, but kind of in the best ways. Like I love it. I hate it. It breaks me down. It makes me think. That's what a Kendrick Lamar album is and does and should do. I don't have a score for you, honestly. So I'm sorry if that's a little disappointing because it might take me years to figure that out. And the points do not matter on the show anyways. Points but I can definitely say, no, they don't. It's all subjective. It's stupid and silly. But I think I can definitely say this is one of the best albums I've heard this year. It's definitely the one I can't stop listening to, even the moments I'm not in love with so far. And in terms of the standouts, they change daily. But some of my favorites right now, N95, Rich Spirit, Mr. Morrell, Mother I Sober is probably the most powerful to me. And I love Mirror being the closing track because who honestly knows if we ever get another Kendrick album. And if we don't, the last words he said on his last record would be, I choose me, I'm sorry, which is beautiful and powerful and probably the most Kendrick thing I've ever heard. But to be honest, I don't think this is the end. I think we're still very far from it. He's going to be busy building this PG Lang label, and he's already announced his tour with Baby Keem and the other newer guy they signed. I don't know his name. I'm pretty sure that'll be massive. This is going to be the most interesting Kendrick era so far, and... I'm still just trying to wrap my head around it, but those are my initial thoughts and feelings. I'm sorry I don't have a more cohesive review, but I hope you understood at least how I felt listening to it, but I want to know how you felt listening to it. So please, sir, talk to me. Well, I think, uh, I think what you said was very beautifully said. Um, how does one even sit down to write a review about this? Like I, 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 I'll, I'll spoil the end of my review. I also don't have a score. I don't know how anybody can put a score to this, um, at least this early. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's high art. That's for sure. Um, I think this is something that this release will kind of go down as music history where you've got this giant recording artist put out something that has almost no commercial appeal. And if there is commercial appeal, then it is. The songs are too long for the radio. They're not radio friendly because they're all really sad. At least Adele, when she puts sad songs out, there's there's like light and positivity with it. There's not like a whole lot of that here. Um, but look, so Kendrick on this one goes on a deep dive of his pain, his suffering, his challenges. This is a really brave album for anybody to put out. Um, let alone someone for the top of the charts and who has been for years and, you know, likely will be there for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, he tackles a lot of really polarizing topics um, and 
it's obvious that this album is going to continue to make waves probably for the next decade. Yes. Um, instrumentally, this album is not quite what I expected. Um, I actually thought we were going to get an even more avant-garde instrumental concept, kind of like we did with To Pimp a Butterfly, which we've talked about a number of times. It's not my favorite. I was actually expecting to not really like a lot of the instrumentals, but I was proven wrong there. He didn't quite do that, but he, he, he really went into this project and just took all the rules of rap right threw them right out the window. Mm -hmm. I think it translates really well into this project. There are zero bangers on this album. There's a lot of great songs, but there's no true radio banger, which is honestly, it's kind of refreshing. Um, one of, we cried together isn't a banger. <laughs> <laughs> one of the wildest feelings I got when listening to music ever was when we cry together came on for the first time. <laughs> Perfect time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, uh, man. That was a, that was an interesting listen. I we should not have been in that room. That's all I got to say. Um, I, I think no. I think I think that's really I think it's performed really beautifully. I think it's really poignant. Um, I lived at the Desert Fountains apartments. <laughs> I know what that sounds like. <laughs> oh, man. Cardboard for walls over there. Look, um, one of, John, one of the best things about human beings is uh, humans and language and communities is that we all have unique perspectives that no one gets to know unless you tell them. Uh, we hear a lot of this. We hear a lot of that on this album. Uh, mm -hmm. Like when he kind of glances over at Kanye and Drake from a distance and even just the fact that Kodak is on the album in a much larger way than anybody would have expected at all. Um, and the language that he uses that is super intentionally offensive just to drive a point home. And honestly, the rawness of being able to accept his own flaws and recognize them and heal collectively with the listener throughout this whole project. Look, I have a ton of good things to say about this project, but it's going to have to sit with me for a long time. I can't I can't give it a score right now. All I right. Think, go ahead. No, no. I Please finish what you were going to say. Well, I think it took everyone by surprise, and the people that weren't ready for healing and self-reflection prior to listening to this album may not have been ready and probably won't like it. Um, the one thing I didn't like about it is the fact that I, I, I think... And this is all this is all speculation. My thing is that I think he was trying to give Kodak a voice to heal publicly. I mean, he talks vocally about cancel culture and a lot of that stuff on this album. And then he has Kodak on as if to have Kodak redeem himself. But I don't think anybody pushed Kodak black enough to open up because he had the opportunity to a number of times and just did it and was just Kodak black. Uh, that's the only thing that I really dislike about this project right now. Um, and if there is anything else that's rubbing me the wrong way, it's going to have to wait until I can actually articulate it. We should probably do like a six month after the release for this one, because this one's going to have to sit. Didn't I agree? Man. I, I agree. Um, I think since we're both in kind of the same, same part here, same headspace, let's try and do just a fun little thing. Uh, Best feature. Who is your favorite feature on the album? Uh, let me pull it up here. Um, Ghostface Killer. I Summer really Walker. like Beth. I really like Mother Ice Over with Beth Gibbons. Beth, Beth Gibbons. Yep. I think it's arguable. It's probably my least favorite song, but I think Taylor Page on We Cry Together is one of the better performances on the album. Easy. In terms of like what a skit is, that's an Alchemist beat too. Yeah, it is. Um, do you think they wasted an alchemist beat? How do you feel about that? There's a lot of talk about this song online. A lot of people are not happy about it. I don't think they wasted an alchemist beat, but I think they definitely could have had another one somewhere else on the album. But I, again, instrumentally, this isn't, this all took me by surprise instrumentally. So, uh, I don't think they wasted it at all. I thought it was fucking great. I, I, I'm everybody's saying that they're going to skip this song on subsequent listens. I listen to it. I think it's weird, but I kind of love it. It's really like raw, man. It's beautifully performed. I'm with you. I don't skip it every time, but I don't listen to it every time either. Uh, did you didn't say a favorite song, did you? 
no, I really like N95. Um, I, I really did like Silent Hill with Kodak, but I think my favorite, which is going to just continue to be my favorite, that's going to be Mother Eye Sober. Yeah, I think Mother Eye Sober and Father Time are probably the the most like introspective Kendrick songs we were going to get. I think N95 is the rap Kendrick that everybody wanted to hear just him going and even United in Grief is a lot of that too. I love the percussion in that song too. Yep. Just the whole pro- production of this album. Yeah, Silent Hill was surprisingly good. I don't like Kodak Black's part, but having uh silenced gunshots in a beat is incredible and more rappers should right. do it <laughs> uh i i like like purple hearts and die hard like the, that's where it feels like he wasn't overthinking the album for a song you know like yeah i have a few people i can collaborate collaborate with like let's just make a little jam and unfortunately i don't think either of those are going to be big hits but i enjoyed them man i enjoyed the whole album and like I said, I just can't stop listening to it. Every time I'm like, I'm burning myself out on it. I find myself like, oh no, I got to go back and revisit this because I have a new thought. Yeah, it's it's something I, I, I think I've listened to it 10 times. Mm-hmm. And least. it is an hour and 13 minutes. So that is yeah. 10 hours of your week. And that is... Well spent. On a week. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. But that was during a week we have other albums to review so let's move on to those albums now cool we have a new one from the smile a light for attracting attention i don't want to say a word brandon please go first (laughs) on this album i need to know your unfiltered feelings before i can sway you either way all right like you suggested i poured myself a glass of something nice i lit a candle and i dug into this album with my new headphones on Um, somebody please sponsor us so I can throw some brand names out there. Um, I think I finally found what I don't like about Tom York. It is experimental just to be experimental. I don't know if you've ever listened to the band Deicide, but they're a very, uh, seminal death metal band, um, that I loved up until a point, uh, scars of the crucifix released in 2003 will probably forever be one of my favorite death metal albums. However, when they released the follow-up to that album, the stench of redemption, I couldn't tell why I didn't like it. I bought the CD. I waited in line and went to the record alley to buy it. Cause they were his best buy. Didn't have death metal albums for some reason. Weird. Um, It's because it was technical death metal, but it was just too technical to be technical. The multiple solos that probably won't ever really be able to be replicated live just didn't add to the music to me, and they had me waiting for more of their music. All of that being said, I did like a lot of this album. I can see why there are so many bands that are just adjacent to Radiohead and The Smile that I really like. Like you've said, I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of, you heard a lot of Radiohead out of the Arcade Fire album. You, you've said, how do you not like Radiohead and still like Clank stuff? You know, like there, there's, mm-hmm. there's a ton, there's a ton of that. And I can totally see why I like all of those adjacent bands and not this one. So let's, let's go into the specifics that I didn't like. I don't like York's voice. I think, um, the way he mumbles and also like squeaks at the same time is just something I, I can't wrap my head around. Um, it isn't all the time. And when he does enunciate, it's very good. Uh, I don't like the really weird out of key electronic influences. And to be clear, I really love electronic influences and rock music. Uh, I mean, we just reviewed a spirit box and a Lenium collab that just blew my face off. Right. I just think that they don't do them well in the context that they do them i don't know things i really fucking liked about this album john there are a ton of great riffs on this really classic rock and roll riffs that are being modernized and kind of repopularized that i I just fucking dig it i was actually listening to pink floyd the other day and some of these riffs remind me of some of theirs um they've got a sound that really builds kind of like arcade fires does where in each song it's kind of its own little project which which i love um uh, I think a lot of the lyrics, I had to look them up since I can't really make out what this guy says a lot of the time, are really great. They clearly put a lot of inf- effort into what they say, when they say it, and they clearly have a lot to say. 
I did enjoy listening to this album. And while there's a number of skips for me for the reasons I mentioned earlier, the ones that hit really fucking hit. I gave it a seven. My standout is we don't know what tomorrow brings because there's no weird shit in it. It is just a great project with great lyrics, with great riffs, and it's just my jam. And also, I really liked the drum progressions and some of the cool polyrhythms that they do. I, I really like that. That's my review of The Smile. Learn to love the weird shit, Brandon. I like weird shit, man. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm the one who throws Mogwai on every time they a release seven, A seven's fair. A seven's higher than I was expecting from you, to be honest. And I know you gave it a proper listen. I I don't think we're far off either. I think that this album's beautiful, but I also think it's a bit of a grower. I've been listening to some of these songs for months, and some of them did not start clicking until I heard the album in full. My only initial criticism was with the sequencing of the first few songs it seems a little off and a little like it can't find its groove but once it does i'm hooked man that run of songs from panavision to a hairdryer i was in a trance man just gone and i'm a big fan of how string heavy that section of the album is you can add strings to anything and i'm gonna love it but the strings on this album are really really special i think Tom and Johnny did a fantastic job, but I think every other musician and producer who worked on the album did great too. I gave it an eight and my favorite was either the smoker or thin thing. Neat. So yeah, the baseline on the smoke is really good. Yeah. That, that one's so good. They, they just put out a music video for thin thing. That's really good. I'm glad you at least enjoyed the album, man. I did. I didn't I didn't hate it. And I would probably I mean, when we when we get into Radiohead conversations and if you if you asked me to do the same treatment with this as, you know, with uh, like, OK, computer or whatever your favorite Radiohead album is, I I would probably feel very similar way because I'm sure there's a bunch of great riffs, but I'm sure there's a bunch of mumbling that I can't fucking stand. And I'm sure there's a bunch of weird electronic elements that I don't quite get because they're all super off key. But I think I would still like the music. Let's do it this week. Let's do The Suburbs and OK Computer. Okay. I'm up for that. All right. Sounds good, man. Okay. All right. Well, we won't talk about this any further so that we can save our breath for that. So let's move on to this new one from State Champs, Kings of the New Age. Look, man, this is a straightforward, no frills pop punk record. 11 songs, 35 minutes, catchy, energetic good encapsulation of everything i love about the genre it's fun to drive around and it should translate well live too like i think that if this album dropped in 2005 it definitely would have made it into my car cd case rotation what about you (laughs) i still have a car cd case john Oh, of um, course. You do. do you have the visor <laughs> or just the book? Uh, I actually keep a lot of the jewel cases in my glove in my glove box. Old school, man. I love it. Yeah, I man. love it. Just in case I need to listen. Like, what, what, what was that lyric? So I can pull out the cute little booklet, you know? Yeah. For the people yeah. listening, CDs uh, are... I'm just kidding. Um, all right. <laughs> this is quite honestly one of the best start of summer pop punk albums I've heard at least in the last decade. Um, This is getting a lot of praise as it should. There's lots of classic elements. The dude's voice is great. The chords are great. The vibe is just amazing. I'm just really a big fan of this, man. It's fun. It's lighthearted. It's exactly what the world needs. Um, I listen to it a ton and I'll be listening to it a ton throughout the year. It's, I mean, between this mom jeans and pup, we have the trifecta of fantastic pop pub music to last us through the next couple of years. Uh, I agree, man. I think my favorite is eventually. It just same. It, it just it's every song on this album is a fucking banger. But I think my I think my standout is eventually because I, I, even today, man, I'm I was I was dry I was driving uh, to go grab a coffee and just I just I was just singing in the car, windows down. It's all hot. It just it felt perfect, <laughs> man. Dare I ask? Did you order the vinyl? Uh, definitely. I knew it. I knew it. Definitely. The second I saw the cover for this one, I knew you'd order the final. Of course. I love it, Brandon. I love it. Um, What was your score for it? I gave it a seven. Okay, same, same. And eventually it was also my standout. Nice. Okay, let's talk about this new Florence and the Machine album, Dance Fever. 
did this live up to your expectations for it? Uh, I'm I'm just I'm just gonna jump in. I know Go. that we were kind of shaky on the singles. Um, I, I I I tried so hard. Let, let, let me back up. I did enjoy listening to this album when I had the patience for it. Um, her voice is obviously, seriously, just so, something else. Like her voice is so unique. You can tell immediately when a Florence song comes on because you're like, oh, there's Florence. <sighs> Look, this album's a weird one, man, because I really wanted to like it more than I actually did. It just kind of dragged, man, my attention. Just kept dragging while listening to it. I, I wish I liked it more. I don't think this album will age gracefully because it talks a lot about COVID stuff and uh, shit that people are trying to forget right now. Um, I really did like my standout is actually Morning Elvis, the last song on the album, um, which is about um, her struggles with alcoholism, which I think is one of the most real songs on this album. I disliked it, man. Like I, I really wanted to like it, but I disliked it. I gave it a three. I completely disagree with you, buddy. Really? Um, yeah, I'm, and I've been completely in line with you on all of the singles. I'm usually not a fan of anything that can be described as indie folk pop, but <laughs> I think the, the way they incorporate like a lot of elements of rock and soul into their music makes it easier for me to dive into. And her voice is incredible. You and I have both said that off the bat. Like that's always going to be spectacular. true. Spectacular. But I feel like there's moments on this album that it really like pulls you by the collar and makes you appreciate it. Like she has this ethereal magnetism and it's hard to define, but it's just really special when you hear it. And especially on songs like Back in Town, where her voice is the song, you know, she's one of very few vocalists other than like Fiona Apple that can pull off a track like that and make it sound that incredible. And she isn't all that out that 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 makes this album work though in my opinion i feel like i was a little bit reductive of the band's contributions when we were covering the singles but i honestly think they did a good job creating the sonic landscape for this album their music comes across very simple at times and i think you're right it does drag i'll give you that but there's a quiet grandiosity that i find really captivating I like and that. i think quiet it's grandiosity that's that's a you. really good way to describe thank you yeah that's that's kind of like how it made me feel it but the music feels perfectly tailored to her voice and all of the instrumentation on this album to me is excellent if you're in the patient mindset to listen to it of course i don't know their music well enough to say where this album fits into their discography but i think songs like king and my love are up there with some of my other favorites of theirs and we'll see how much I return to this album over time. I, I honestly don't know that I will, but I've enjoyed my time with it so far. I'd give it a seven or an eight. Let me let uh, may, may, maybe I will uh, give it another sun. Give it a Sunday morning coffee vibe check. Maybe it, maybe that's maybe that's where it fits for me. Maybe I and I don't think you're wrong. I wouldn't disagree with anything you said. I would say it drags a little, but I think like the checkpoints like. King starts off on such a good note and the imagery of the, her lyrics in that song are just really powerful to me. And then back in town, like I said, just reminiscent of Fiona Apple. The middle of the album's a little bloated. That's where I think it could have been trimmed. But my love through Morning Elvis, I think, is a really good ending to the album, too. What's your standout? Uh, it's either King or My Love. I would say King's the one I've listened to the most, but I, I really like My Love as well. Nice. All right, man, let's move on to the last album we have this week. New one from the Black Keys, Drop Out Boogie. Oh, is this the new Delta Cream or did you like this one? <laughs> uh, this is a Black Keys album. Uh, yeah. I liked this one far better than I liked the last one. The lyrics actually make sense mo most, most of the time. Um, it's got a decent flow to it. It really isn't much to say about this other album other than the fact that it's okay. It's not great. It's not bad. It isn't essential Black Keys listening, but it isn't something that I'd tell someone to skip if they were just getting into them uh, like I would with Delta Cream. Uh, I give it a five, and I don't really have a standout because they're all the same. Yep. Uh, I, I agree, man. I, I 
thank you for saying that because i really didn't know what to say about it i i think the album's fine like it's got all these bluesy garage rock riffs that you're expecting from new black keys but nothing's gonna blow you away i think tracks like wild child it ain't over and good love are great but they still just sound like a shadow of the band that gave us brothers el camino and rubber factory at this right you know and I don't think that this is a bad album. I just don't think it's a great one either. And you know the music will always deliver when it comes to them. But the vocals have just been really hit or miss the past few years. I'm with you on, on this one, man. I give it a 5 out of 10. I think Good Love was probably my favorite if I had to pick. If I had to pick, I think Wild Child is probably more up my alley because of that. Just the way that it is. Yeah, um, the riff. Yeah. I'd like to take a moment uh, before we end up here. Uh, are you done with the Black Keys? Yeah. I revisited Pusha T's album. Okay. It's a nine and a half. It's not a 10 for me, but it's a nine and a half. I wanted to just, I, I wanted to just go on record on the air without you knowing that I went back and I revisited it. And it's not a 10 for me because of the things that I mentioned in that review. Sure. But it is a nine and a half and I should have given it that half point back then. We don't really do halves. And I mean, maybe, I don't know, man. It's funny because you and I at times, because of the amount of albums we listen to and kind of how we rank them, probably feel like we need a decimal system because it would like, there's like, whenever you're like, oh, this album's a seven. And then you're like, wait a minute. I don't think it's as good as all these other sevens. Like, that's kind of where the decimals help. But at the same time, you and I don't really take this shit too seriously. And yeah, none, none of this it matters. really matters. Like, we could even go broader and do full stars one through five, and I would be just as fine. Like, like I, I feel like you and I are both slightly pedantic music nerds, and we love the minutia of it. But nobody should take it too seriously, because it changes daily and with every listen. Yeah, I mean that that that's real. I I, I guess I more wanted to tell you that I. I love that it was weighing on your mind. It was that heavily though, because I'm a dork like that, and it and <laughs> shit does that. Like I think like after I gave the Olivia Rodrigo album a nine, I thought about it for like two days. I was <laughs> like, is that really a nine? Uh, <laughs> what's funny is I think I circled back mentally, and it is like I think it's, that it's a good album, bro. I think in terms of like commercial significance that one has aged quite well yes her next album will be terrible i think we can oh god prob- yeah I think sophomore we can slumps just, coming up i think we could just probably throw that throw that right in the trash when i'm waiting after we review it i'll but. text you the uh she's hired jack antonoff to produce her next album <laughs> <laughs> headline when i see it pop up on pitch oh four. man uh Antonov is doing, I think, a festival or something. Or no, he's doing the soundtrack for um, a Disney movie, I think. And there is a bunch of cool covers. Um, now I need to now I need to find it. That um, might be up his alley. I just don't think he's as good at mainstream pop as everyone says he is. Hold on. Now I got to find it while, while we're here. Antonov. Please do. Soundtrack. It's not a bleachers thing. Uh, bleachers is on it but it's not it's Mm -hmm. not a bleachers thing um let me see here that's interesting he's Um, all over the place so it's a it it is a uh is this the one yep it is the one um it is a movie that i will not be seeing but i will be listening to the uh to the uh soundtrack for it i think it is minions rise of Gru. (laughs) And uh, there's a bunch of cool covers on it. We've got we're gonna get a Funky Town cover by Saint Vincent. We're gonna get a Brockhampton uh, cover of uh, Cool and the Gang's Hollywood Swingin'. Uh, we're gonna get a Caliuchis cover of Dessa Finado by Stan Getz. Uh, we're gonna All get right, a I mean. we're, we're gonna get a Caroline Polachek cover of Bang Bang by Nancy Sinatra. Um, we're gonna get and this one is the one that I was like, wait, a Thundercat cover of Fly Like an Eagle by the Steve Miller Band. Oh, that's gonna be incredible. <laughs> yeah, man, I think we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get a Tierra Whack cover of Black Magic Woman by Santana. Um, 
I mean, we're gonna get some some really cool uh, it's fucking stacked really cool co- for a it's Minions album. That's fucking absolutely stacked. stacked, bro. So uh, I, you're gonna at one point have to give some props over to Mr. Antonoff. Uh, I will not, but <laughs> I am looking forward to hearing that record. Uh, so this week we have kind of a quiet week. We have Flume's new album Palace is dropping, which I'm pretty sure we've heard like half of at this point. Right. I'm still very much looking forward to it. We are now going to be doing The Suburbs by Arcade Fire and Radiohead's OK Computer, two albums you and I have both been wanting to talk to each other about. Is OK Computer the one you want me to listen to? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's the starting point. We'll go from there. Okay. And, um, We'll see what else we add. We'll have some Black Thought on there next week. We're getting a new single from They coming out. A uh, new single from Interpol this week. New a single new from Coheed? John Legend. Ooh. Wait, the new album's next week, it, right? It was, but they pushed it to June, and I think it uh, had something to do with some sort of vinyl shortages. If anybody wants to thank anybody for vinyl shortages, you can go to your local Target and burn all of the Adele albums. God damn it, there is a lot of those. <laughs> um, new Purple Disco Machine official remix of About Damn Time for Lizzo. Huge for Purple Disco Machine, getting that. Um, new Maxo Cream, Santa Gold, produced by Boys Noise, new Soccer Mommy. It's going to be a fun week, man. I'm excited. Anything you want to say before we get out of here? Uh, not really, except for, uh, you know, go everybody go to our website. Um, we've got a uh, a great release calendar, which I have to update. But um, you know, yes, follow us on we'll the socials, and uh, we will uh, we will see you next week. See you next week, everybody. Peace. Peace.